Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to Native Gardening and Audubon's Plants for Birds program with Catherine D'Amico, our speaker this evening, um, who will be joining me on screen shortly. Um, this program is presented by the Heckscher Museum of Art. Here we have Catherine with us. Hi, Catherine. Um, the Heckscher Museum is presenting this program as part of this year's Virtual Art in Bloom series. We are thrilled to provide programming that covers a diverse range of topics, including floral design, gardening, art and architecture, um, and many other topics coinciding with our upcoming Art in Bloom weekend in June. I wanted to take a moment to thank our sponsors of Art in Bloom, Robin T. Hadley, Natalia and Paul Lamb, and Patricia P. Sands. And thank you to our participating garden clubs for Art and Bloom this year, North Country Garden Club, North Suffolk Garden Club, Southside Garden Club, and Three Harbors Garden Club. Last but not least, thank you to all of you for joining us today and um, for your ongoing support of the museum. We're thrilled to have you with us. I'm Caitlin Scherer, Development Manager at the museum, and I'll be your host for this evening. Joining me on screen is Catherine D'Amico, Center Director of the Theodore Roosevelt Sanctuary and Audubon Center. Catherine grew up on the North Shore, or sorry, South Shore of Long Island um, and has always been fascinated with the balance of nature. She graduated from SUNY Empire State College with a BS in environmental science, focusing her work on ecology. Catherine lived in Austin, Texas, where she worked at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center first in membership and then on a grant program researching invasive plant species. Catherine then began volunteering on many habitat restoration projects as well as native plant projects and vegetation surveys. After moving back to her hometown on Long Island, she began volunteering for Audubon and um, that's what led her to the TR Center um, where she could combine her environmental education and business background. So we're thrilled that she'll be sharing her knowledge and experience with us here today. At the end of her presentation, our speaker will be responding to some of your questions. So please feel free to type whatever questions or comments you might have into the Q&A box on your screen or the chat box. Without any further ado, I'll now hand the program over to Catherine. Thanks, Caitlin, and thank you so much for inviting me to do this. What a perfect topic for the Theodore Roosevelt Sanctuary. Um, we have a beautiful gardens right now. If you haven't been out this spring, you should come and take a walk through. Um, but it's really important to me to um, connect art and nature at the center. So when um, Patsy and you contacted me about doing this program, I said, oh, what a perfect fit. And actually, um, in two weeks, our benefit is going to be art and music in the gardens. So um, that's just one example of how I'm trying to connect local artists and uh, the history of art in the sanctuary with nature and with our mission at the um, center. So let me try and share my screen here. See if I can get my slideshow going. Okay. You can see that, okay. I'm just going to optimize. Just fixing a couple of settings here. I wanna make sure my sound is sharing. And uh, I should bear with me one more second. Zoom can always be a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> okay, so today I'm going to be telling you about um, three different things. I'm going to start my presentation with a little background on um, the Audubon Society. I'm going to be talking about the Theodore Roosevelt Sanctuary and the history and connection to art. Um, and then I want to tell you about our Plants for Bird program and tying it into our demonstration gardens and the programming we do around bird friendly communities. So let me just move my own picture out of the way here. Okay. So I always like to start these presentations by giving a little bit of background on um, Audubon. It, it can be sometimes a confusing uh, framework because it's such a big national organization. 
And we work on a lot of initiatives that are related to birds. It's not just birds, um, but it's mainly birds, but related to a lot of conservation initiatives. So I always like to give some background. So the mission of the Audubon Society is to protect birds in the places that they need today and tomorrow throughout the Americas using science, advocacy, education, and on the ground conservation. And we work in um, five main areas or initiatives. Um, those are coasts, working lands, water, bird friendly communities, and climate. At the TR Sanctuary, our main focus out of these national initiatives is bird friendly communities, which would includes the Plants for Birds program and the Coasts Initiative with a robust uh, coastal resiliency and shorebird monitoring program that we do. We also touch on um, climate, but um, we don't have many programs related to climate, but it's definitely a common thread throughout some of our other work. Our nationwide influence is really great at Audubon, and this is one of the best things about our organization is, is that it is a national organization, so we have a great reach for our conservation missioning. Um, we have 23 state offices, 41 nature centers, 452 Audubon chapters, so that just shows you that the grassroots volunteer efforts are really strong, and 1.4 million members nationally. In New York and Connecticut, um, our two sister states that work together, we have seven nature centers, 32 Audubon chapters, and I think New York has um, the greatest amount of Audubon chapters in the country. 12 sanctuaries, which we are one, we're a center and a sanctuary. And in New York and Connecticut, we have 85,000 members just in those two states. And all of these dots here that you can see are um, different nature centers, state offices, sanctuaries, and chapters. And then I like to always show this graphic because this is what it's really important to us at Audubon. Um, and it really brings it home that billions of migratory birds, that's bi billions with a B, follow these flyways from their wintering grounds and their breeding grounds and back again. So if you notice on um, this map, the yellow land birds or songbirds um, migration route, the orange shorebird migration route, and the blue raptors migration route all cross right over Long Island. Um, and that's really significant because Many of those billions of birds are stopping here and some of them are nesting here. A lot of shorebirds nest here. So it's an IBA, an important bird area, and is really critical to a lot of different species. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about our Audubon Center right here in Oyster Bay, Long Island um, in New York. So um, Sagamore Hill TR Summer Home is about a mile up the road from where the sanctuary grounds sit. We're about 12 acres of land and we are um, right next door to where President Theodore Roosevelt is buried, his final resting place. Um, this was his favorite place in the world, TR. He uh, wanted to be buried up on the hill overlooking the cove and the water of Long Island Sound. Um, he said that he felt the best uh, anywhere that he was in the world. He always felt the healthiest and the best in Oyster Bay at Sagamore Hill. He used to ride horses with his cousin on this property, this 12 acres of property. And we have some um, entries of his that say that this area in Oyster Bay was the place that he saw more songbirds than anywhere else that he had ever been in the world. So it was a natural thing that his cousins, um, Emlyn and Christine Roosevelt, left this, donated this 12 acres of property right next to the cemetery to the National Audubon Societies, and that was way back in 1923. So this property became the very first National Audubon Songbird Sanctuary in the country. Um, and we're almost 100 years old now, and the property is almost the same as when it was donated to Audubon. So I feel like we've been doing a really good job at stewarding it. Um, so now I wanna talk a little bit about the very beginnings of the sanctuary in 1923 and how art it was present in nature from the very start. Um, this was this fountain statue that's in the center. It's the, really the focal point of the um, front of the property. 
1927, this memorial bird fountain um, was designed and executed by sculptor Bessie Potter Vanel. She is a very famous sculptor um, and artist, and you see a picture of her there on the right working on this beautiful fountain. Um, she has other works in the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. She also has another very beautiful fountain sculpture in Central Park. And in the Museum of Natural History in New York City, um, there's a diorama dedicated to the sanctuary with where you can see um, in the background the fountain. Um, and it's in the TR Hall. So if you're ever there, um, funny story, I actually went with my children um, about six years ago and it was just a day off of school and we were visiting the museum and we were in Teddy Roosevelt Hall, of course, because I work at Theodore Roosevelt Sanctuary. So we were walking around and we got to this diorama and I said, wait a minute, this looks really familiar. <laughs> and it turns out it was familiar because it was the sanctuary. Um, here's another example of how art in nature was present at the very beginning. The entrance gates were, um, have a beautiful handmade um, metal ribbon above them and the gates themselves were all handmade. Um, this picture on the left is from 1928. And I actually, you're gonna see in um, a couple of slides that I had the original ribbon restored for our new entrance plaza um, when we renovated the sanctuary two years ago. I love this picture on the right. It's um, the fountain in the middle of the winter. This one's from 2008 um, in the snow. And I love it because it really shows that the art is emphasized by the nature. The snow just emphasizes the sculpture so much, but also you could think of it the other way around is that, you know, nature is emphasized by the sculpture. So it goes both ways. Here's that um, other fountain sculpture I was talking about that's in Central Park in New York City. I think it's up by like a hundred and Fifth Street, I believe. Um, and that's also by Vano. It's, you can see it's very similar and also has running water um, that comes out of the basin. It's really nice to just sit and listen to. And here's a picture of the uh, diorama um, of the bird sanctuary that's in the American Museum of Natural History um, in Theodore Roosevelt Memorial Hall. So supposedly there is, I think, 70 or 90 bird species in this diorama. And um, if you have an entire day, you can try and find them all. But <laughs> I did not find that many. I think I found about half of that. <laughs> so now I wanna um, go into a little bit about um, Audubon's Bird Friendly Communities Initiative. And with that, um, our Plants for Birds program. So the Plants for Birds program is fairly new to Audubon um, and it really encompasses um, why it's so important to use native plants in your landscapes and in your habitats. So here we see a cute little American robin um, eating what I believe is a service berry, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, but they do eat uh, mainly fruit and of course when they're nesting there digging for worms, but so I want to see if I can get this little video clip to play because it's going to introduce you to our program. Let me just optimize the video. Okay, and hopefully you'll be able to hear it.
able to hear that, Caitlin? Hopefully. If not, you probably got the gist because uh, you could see the slides. Um, so that's just like, a, I love that little cute video because it's it really sums up um, how the Bird Friendly Communities program works and how all those little bits add up, not only for birds, but for insects, for pollinators, for other um, animals and wildlife using the habitat and for the actual native plants themselves, which are being outcompeted. So I, I love that little one minute video really <laughs> sums it up well. So Audubon protects bird populations in American cities and towns by providing um, several important things, food for birds, shelter, safe passage, and places for them to raise their young and nest. Um, communities meet those needs through individual and collective actions, actions that also contribute to a more sustainable human society. So what's good for the birds is good for us. And we always like to say that birds are, it's not just about birds. If you don't like birds or you're not a, a bird lover, that's okay. But birds are a really good indicator species. So what that means is what's happening with the birds can tell us what's gonna be happening with the rest of the habitat, the rest of the ecosystem and for people. Um, there, you know, if you think about the canary in the coal mine, uh, it's a very similar analogy. So what's, they're the first ones to react to environmental changes and to things happening. Um, so we can look at the birds and we can really see, you know, what's indicated about the, um, climate, about the health of our world and our habitats, um, and really um, take note of it and try and collect the data. Um, here's the website. It, it, we'll put that in the chat um, at the end. So if you want to visit, you can. There's lots of articles. There's lots of information. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more in a few minutes about the Native Plants Database, um, which is a great resource. So save the birds and you can save the world. Why? Well, um, there's a lot of reasons that the things that are good for birds are good for people. And um, that is one of the main driving reasons that we are renovating and have renovated so much of the front gardens at the TR Sanctuary. So we replaced um, the whole front portion of the sanctuary property, probably about two acres of the 12 to 14 acres that we have um, with demonstration gardens, native demonstration gardens. We put in 21,000 new native plants, shrubs and trees. Um, we're building a new education center wing on the back of our historic um, Ornitho original ornithologist and land stewards house that's still on the property. Um, so we're restoring that his old house and putting a new education wing on it. Um, and that's going to really help us because we're trying to really increase the amount of program we're doing around several different topics. So one of our major um, flagship programs is For the Birds. And this is a multi-sessional school-aged program where we go into schools, we teach kids about bird biology, about um, habitats, uh, field marks, different um, adaptations that birds have, what they need to survive, um, why the environment is important for them. We do a shorebird importance lesson since we're on Long Island and our coast work is a big part of our initiative at the sanctuary. Um, so we teach them about shorebirds, uh, threatened and endangered species of birds that are on Long Island. So they learn what that means when a bird is threatened or what it means when they're endangered. Um, we also have a very new program on coastal resiliency and salt marsh restoration. Um, we're working at three different sites on Long Island with several um, partners on restoration projects and resiliency pro projects. Um, we're working in Mastic Beach um, at Sunken Meadow State Park. We just got funding to start a project there. And these are very long projects, five to seven or 10 years long. Um, and we're in the beginning phases of that work, but it's really important um, work, coastal resiliency. And that's all based, the coast team is all based out of the TR Center. 
Another education program and outreach program that we do is called Be a Good Egg. Um, we go out on all of our beaches on the north and south shore of Long Island and in the summer months during the nesting season. And we have, hold outreach event days with um, volunteers and staff. And we basically try to educate beachgoers and people that are using the beach to share the shore with um, shorebirds and the other wildlife that are there and to um, be careful about preserving the health of Long Island Sound. Um, so we ask people to sign a pledge um, saying that they will take their garbage with them when they leave so it doesn't attract predators to the beach and doesn't um, pollute the sound or the South Shore beaches. We ask them to stay out of the fenced areas where birds are nesting. Um, many of these fenced areas, especially on the North Shore, have um, piping clovers or least terns, both of which are endangered and threatened um, that are nesting there. And we ask them to keep their dogs off of the beach, um, nesting beaches and out of the string fenced areas. Um, so that's been a program that's been going on for probably six or seven years now. Um, it's funded by, on the North Shore by uh, National Fish and Wildlife. Um, and it's a great program. We reach thousands of people each year and um, we really, you know, explain that most people don't even realize that there's nesting birds on the beaches. They don't know what the fencing's for. They don't, they don't realize that there's birds nesting there. So it's a great education and outreach program. Um, and then our nature camps, which have been going on forever. We're at the point now, I think there are 30 plus years we've been having um, summer nature camp at the sanctuary. And we're at the point now where we have parents that came to camp there and now they're bringing their kids. So it's a real um, mom and pop kind of feel. Uh, it's a family style camp, lots of siblings. And um, we couldn't hold it last year because of COVID. So we're thrilled that we're able to have it this year. Um, and then our Plants for Birds program and trainings are really starting to take off. We've been doing um, training for professionals, so landscape professionals, nursery owners, um, landscape architects, um, all different kinds of professionals in the industry, because we're trying to reach a broader audience so that um, if the professionals are using native plants and ecoscaping in their projects, then we can reach a, a broader audience that way than just um, telling individual homeowners about it. So we've really been trying to um, partner with a lot of people and do these types of um, trainings. We also have our plant sales. Hopefully some of you have been to them. Um, we've been upping these every year because they're so popular. We used to have one a year, then we had two a year. Now we are having, we think we had three this spring and two last fall. We'll have two again this fall. Um, fall planting is really great. Um, but the plant sales are really popular because people are really realizing that native plants are amazing. They're perennials, they come back every year. They're healthy, they attract butterflies and bees and birds that people have never seen on their properties before. They have so much interest in the landscape. Um, rather than just a lawn and some shrubs, you know, or hedges. They, native plants are beautiful. They bloom at all different times throughout the um, season. So, you know, I think people are really starting to realize that not only is it good for the ecosystem and the habitat, but it's, it's good for people too. And um, it's interesting. So here's some of our projects that I just talked about in action. Um, these kiddos here are some of our campers at summer camp and we they wanted to do a planting project. So we got some plants and had them clear an area and they were so excited about it and so into it. Um, and they love, they come back every summer so they get to see their plants growing and getting bigger. And um, this center project is two years ago when we put all of our new gardens in. So you could see the massive amount of plants that were laid out. Um, Matthews Nielsen was the uh, landscape architect from New York City and they did a fabulous job. I like to tell people that the rendering that they gave us of the gardens is almost exactly how the gardens look today. So they really, they really were spot on with their design. Um, and this picture on the right is Drexel Avenue School um, in Westbury, and we're doing a schoolyard habitat project there. This is from a couple of years ago, which you could probably tell because nobody has masks on. 
<laughs> but we were just there actually last week doing this same project. We go back every year and this is through a grant with Sagamore Hill um, to put on this for the birds program. So it includes a habitat schoolyard uh, native garden. And this is the kids getting in there and learning about native plants. We also do schoolyard bird walks with them on these days. And here's just some quick pictures of our renovation while it was happening. Um, so this is on the left, the front of the garden. These are our new pathways that are going in and our seating walls um, and the new driveway to the handicap access parking. Um, this was really important. I know it looks like, um, you know, we took out a lot and there's a lot of um, invasive digging and stuff going on here. But the majority of the front of the property was invasive species. Um, and you saw in the beginning those stairways going up to the fountain. The property was really not accessible to anybody um, that had any kind of um, handicap requirements or uh, mobility issues. Um, even people that, you know, maybe walk with a cane or a walker, it was like, impossible to get into the property. So it was really important to us to make sure that everything was ADA accessible, um, that people could come in with strollers, walkers, wheelchairs, and um, be able to enjoy the, the gardens and be able to have access to our new um, education building, which is right in the front of the property. Also right next to some handicap um, parking options. So that was really important. And you can see here on the right side, um, this is the seating wall and the pathway and it's a, a gradual grade up so that it's easier to um, access. In the middle here, hidden in this black cloak is our um, beautiful fountain statue. And this is when um, the new fountain plaza was being um, poured and the stonework was being done. So um, you can see it was all excavated and the, the statue was protected under there. And it's interesting, the statue never moved. It's in the exact same spot that it was always in since 1927. And we built everything else around that um, so that it wouldn't move and it would still be in the position that it was designated to be in um, right in the center of the sanctuary. And here is the new fountain plaza. So I think it looks beautiful with all of that um, garden blocks around it. And we really opened up the property. Um, if you had ever been there before, behind this statue and fountain plaza is where our building was way in the back. Um, it was the original trailside museum. It was renovated in the 70s. And I think that's the last time anybody ever touched it. Um, it, was in, it was kind of crumbling around us and it was in really, really bad shape. There was not really any way to save it. But um, so that came down and we had, I think three or four other buildings. Um, there were animal care building, garages, um, some sheds and they were all in really bad disrepair. So, um, you know, the decision was made to take everything down. And I was kind of on the fence when they said they were gonna take all of the structures down. But once it was done, I realized that, oh, this is how it was supposed to be. This is natural, you know, preserved sanctuary habitat without all of these buildings and structures and things. Um, obstructing it. So now it's really back to being a natural sanctuary and I'm kind of thankful for that. So now these slides coming up are a little bit wordy and I'm just going to go the, through them quick. Um, they really are just talking about the benefits of using native plants. Um, your garden is your outdoor sanctuary. So with some careful plant choices, it can be a haven for birds and wildlife and the ecosystem health as well. Um, so native plants mean more choices for food and shelter for birds and other wildlife. To survive, native birds need native plants and insects because they've co-evolved together. So with 96% of all terrestrial bird species in North America using insects to feed their young, um, exotic plants really create a big problem for that. Exotic plants or that have been brought, brought from other countries and have not co-evolved with these insects, with these pollinators, with these birds, do not have the food sources that are necessary for the ecosystem. 
So most of them have been bred so that they are um, resistant to insects. So the insects aren't on them. So if you have no insects, you have no birds. Um, and I'm sure all of you have heard of this study by Doug Talame. Um, it's just, it's the most direct example and that's why everybody uses it. A native oak tree can support 550 different species of butterflies and moths. So that's a whole lot of caterpillars for birds and other um, things in the habitat to eat. A non-native ginkgo tree can only support five species. So that's showing you the difference in the amount of food source. Um, in 16 days between hatching and fledging, a clutch of Carolina chickadees, little cute birds that you've probably all seen in your yards, can eat more than 9,000 of these caterpillars. So um, in 16 days, they need 9,000 caterpillars. So if you have, if you only have non-native ginkgo trees on your property, you're not gonna have Carolina chickadees and the Carolina chickadees are not gonna be able to have successful nests. Um, I'm gonna kind of go through this quickly because I wanna leave time for questions. Here's a couple of my favorite plants at the sanctuary. I know this is a big plant group here. Um, so I wanted to make sure I pointed some of these out that you can use in your own garden. Minarda didyma, Jacob Klein, it's a scarlet bee balm, um, is this red plant here. And I will tell you that from the time it blooms, it's pretty much in bloom the entire season through from it's just starting to get buds now. So June to September, there are hummingbirds at this patch and the other patches on the property every single day. So the first six years that I worked at the sanctuary, I saw a hummingbird one time. And the past two years since we've had these gardens and there are several other flowers that they like, uh, I've seen a hummingbird almost every single day that I've been there in the summer. So that just goes to show you that the hummingbirds are looking for what they're looking for. And if it's there, they'll come. Um, this middle one is another one that I love, Agasashi. It's Anise Hyssop. Um, you've probably heard it, the common name is Hyssop. And then mixed in with it, we have some Black Eyed Susan, uh, Rebecca. And those two are both great for attracting um, finches and other seed eating birds. I will say that the hyssop during the summer when it's in bloom, the purple like this, is a great pollinator attractor. There's tons of butterflies, um, tons of bees, and not just one species of bee. If you look, you'll see so many different types of bees. Um, it's a great for a pollinator garden. Um, and then in the fall, these seed heads turn brown and they, if you leave them, you will get goldfinches on them almost every single day. They come down and we get flocks of 18, 20, 25 goldfinches at a time. And they're so beautiful, especially the males. And this last one on the right is Tiarella um, cordifolia, foam flower is the common name. And this was just in bloom the past two weeks, um, maybe a little longer, it's still hanging on. It is so beautiful. It looks like uh, clouds of white and also another one that is just covered in all different kinds of tiny butterflies, bees, pollinators. There's so much, so much activity to watch there. It's really, you know, when your garden is like that, it's so interesting. You don't just look at it and walk past and say, oh, that's, you know, a beautiful purple flower. There's so much going on and you can watch um, everything that's going on and all the activity in the habitat. So um, leading off of that into this is the Plants for Birds website. So I just wanted to give you a quick clip in case you wanted to um, learn how to use it. You can visit that website. We'll put it in the uh, chat and you would put in your email address and your zip code. If you don't wanna put in your email address, you don't have to. Um, you could just put your zip code and it will still give you a list, but it gives you a list of native plants that are suitable for your zip code, your geographic area, um, anywhere in the country. Um, the list that comes out looks like this. Here's service berry, a description. You, know, you want a tree that's more than 25 feet tall, you can keep looking down the list. Um, it'll tell you what kind of flowers it gets. But some of my favorite features are, it tells you which bird species that plant attracts, which is great. 
And it also tell you can also sort it by the type of plant. So if you're looking for a shrub or you're looking for a ground cover or you're looking for a tree, um, or maybe you're looking to attract a certain type of bird, you wanna have bluebirds at your property. Um, you can filter this list by any of those and it'll um, give you an updated list. So native plants, they're better for people, why? Um, you can spend less, more time with the birds and less time with your mower. Um, once native plant gardens are established, about two to three years, they really take off on their own. They require um, minimal, you know, watering. You don't have to mow. You don't have to, you do, you always have to weed a little bit in the very early season. But if once they grow in and fill in, there's, you know, much less um, weeding. Um, and it's really better for people because it's keeping a lot of the chemicals and pollutants out of our ecosystems. Um, 56 million Americans mow 40 million acres of grass each week. That's eight times the size of New Jersey. That's how big the lawns are that we're mowing in this country, just in America. Um, lawn mowers and weed whackers burn gasoline 800 million gallons per year. Um, the greenhouse gases that that's using is, is just like astronomical to me. Um, this is another fact that was kind of mind blowing. The EPA estimates that Americans spill more than 17 million gallons of fuel each year while refueling lawn equipment. So what is that doing on Long Island? What is that doing to our Long Island Sound water quality? Um, and we all know about noise pollution. I don't have to tell anybody about the <laughs> lawn mowers and the gardening equipment noise pollution. It also saves water. Um, this is all according to the EPA. 30 to 60% of fresh water in American cities is used for watering lawns. 30 to 60% of our water is going to lawns. Native plants are acclimated to the climate that they're supposed to be in. Our native plants, our sprinkler system just got turned on this week. We, we have a system in our demonstration gardens because the first two years you do need to water until they're established. We just had it turned on this week. I have not watered one time yet this year. Everything in those demonstration gardens is blooming. It, it's growing like crazy and it has been really dry. So I was really pleasantly surprised to see that they are adapted and they're established and they're doing really, really well. Um, they control flooding. So, you know, by cultivating vertical structure in your yard and by planting different species rather than just a, a, a very large lawn, um, you're creating layers of vegetation that deflects pounding rains and increases the chance for the water to be absorbed by your soil before it goes into the storm drains. It's also talking about storm drains, fewer chemicals. So 80 million pounds of pesticides are used in, on lawns in the United States each year. 80 million pounds of chemicals go into our lawns. Um, what happens to that? The rain comes, the sprinklers go on, and it washes down into our water sources, right? Contaminates streams, contaminating our wetlands. We all know about um, algae blooms and, and all the yucky stuff that's going into our um, water. And for us, uh, you know, on Long Island, our beaches are closed every year. Every summer you'll see, you know, the beaches are closed after a big rain because of all the runoff. Native plants are hardier than non-native ornamentals. They can thrive without pesticides or fertilizers. Um, they reduce maintenance. I talked about that. They create beauty. Um, and then I know I'm running out of time, but I do want to get to John James Audubon um, because, you know, the Audubon Society, and this is one of my favorite quotes, and it's by him, a true conservationist, conservationist is a man who knows that the world is not given by his fathers, but borrowed from his children, right? This is what we're leaving to our children, to our grandchildren, this next generation. We have a responsibility to make sure that we're taking care of Long Island, the flyway, North America, and our worlds the best that we can, you know? Um, we're, we're leaving this to them. So, you know, we have to lead by example, we really do. So Audubon, he, he was quite a 
quite a character. Um, he was an American ornithologist, as we all know, and we, we all are familiar with him. Um, he was a naturalist. Some things that really stood out to me that I learned about him is that he was a hunter and he did not like um, killing birds, but he did um, shoot and kill every single one of the birds that he painted. He, he hunted himself. Um, his, one of his most famous con collections, of course, is the Birds of America, 435 life-size prints. Um, and they're still the standard for Peterson, Silby. This is the standard that um, these pieces of art and these um, bird artists hold themselves to. Um, by the time he was 19, he lived in Haiti, France, and America. Um, and he set off in the 1820s very early to depict the, the avifauna and the birds and the plants that they were using, which I always think is really interesting. So um, I, I picked just a few that I thought were some of my favorite plants and some of my favorite birds and are connected to the sanctuary because they're ones that we actually see here. So the ruby-throated hummingbird, which I told you has made a big return. Um, he, this shot is actually by Kathy Haley. This is at the sanctuary last summer, I believe. And there's that um, Minarda bee balm, the scarlet bee balm, red flower. And there's a little female um, hanging out there. And then here's Audubon's print. Um, and they're on a trumpet flower, a red trumpet flower there. But I, I really like the way he uses the fauna to depict the birds as well. Um, here is the American goldfinch. And there he is in the, the cone flower and that um, Agasashi anise hyssop, the hyssop plant that I was telling you about. So he's hanging out on that uh, echinacea purple cone flower, eating those seeds. And then in the fall, he'll move on to the hyssop seeds. Um, and they like the black eyed Susan as well. Um, and here you see a very similar plant. This is a southern plant, a thistle. Um, we do have thistles here too, but um, they love any kind of flowering plant that has seeds like the purple coneflower that they can get to. And here is the wood thrush, which is my absolute favorite plant. I tried to get an audio clip to download so you could hear the wood thrush call. You have to, if you haven't heard one, you should look it up and listen to it. It's the most beautiful song. I just heard one um, about three days ago at the sanctuary in the back. They, um, there was one singing. I was very happy. They, they're pretty much there every year. I think that they used to nest on the property and um, I don't know if they're nesting there anymore, but they come back and visit every um, season, every spring. Um, so this is his depiction, plate 73 of the wood thrush. Um, and you can see the male and female there. And I'll just end on um, a little view of our new center building. So those gardens on the hillside there are our new um, gardens that we put in. And that is the original um, caretaker and ornithologist's home that was um, dated back to the late 1800s. It was actually part of the um, homestead across the street and was moved over there um, and is very close to where um, President Theodore Roosevelt is buried. He's buried up on the hill right behind that house. So we thought it was fitting and it's right next to the parking lot and to the entrance of the, the sanctuary property. So we thought it was very fitting that we would make this our new visitor center and building. It's um, been empty for about 10 years, so it needs a lot of work. It's gonna be um, kept the same street view. Um, Cove Road where we sit is a historic byway on Long Island. Um, so we want, it's important to us to keep the facade of the house the same as it's always been. And you'll see from the side view in the rendering there, um, we're gonna have a program and meeting space uh, education center put on the back and that'll be used for all of the trainings I was talking about, partner meetings, um, school groups and um, the like. And that's it. So I'm more than happy to take any questions. Stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, the video clip worked great, and that was the perfect way to start it. <laughs> Sometimes the volume doesn't uh, come through on Zoom, so. <laughs> yes, no worries. Um, so to start off with, uh, um, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A, but I'll start things off with a few questions that we have here. 
Um, so the first question is, when we say like native plants in the region, how far a region around Long Island are we talking like Connecticut, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, like how far does that region stretch? Well, it depends. It depends who you ask. So I am not a horticulturist, um, but when I refer to native plants um, for our purposes, I always try to get northeast natives. Um, some people who are much more knowledgeable than I am um, don't believe in cultivars. They believe in Long Island natives only. Um, so it, the degree of native can be um, interpreted differently, definitely by um, different people. And I think probably the more you know about that science, the, the more tightly <laughs> you put it. But, um, you know, I like to think of it for our purposes and for plants for birds in terms of ecosystem services. So if you have a native plant that's native to the Northeast and it's providing an ecosystem service for that habitat and ecosystem, then you're doing something good for, for that you know, area. That makes sense. Um, what would you say is the most common bird that you see at the sanctuary? The most common, probably the same as all of you, American Robin. <laughs> Cardinal, Blue Jay, <laughs> they're all here. But at the sanctuary, we have tons of woodpeckers, um, red-bellied woodpeckers year round, downy woodpecker, northern flickers, um, and which one, hairy woodpeckers. So we have lots of woodpeckers. I, I have a feeling they've been here for a long, long, many generations and they really like it here, much more than anywhere else I go on Long Island. Um, so one of our attendees lives in New Hampshire and they're wondering um, where they would get a list of native plants for New Hampshire. Yes. So go on that link that um, Katie put in the chat, Caitlin put in the chat and um, put in your zip code for New Hampshire and it's going to give you a, a list um, for your area for your zip code. And it should also give you um, a list at the bottom of that of nurseries um, where you can source native plants. So that has been really helpful. I will say that the feedback has been not all of them are the greatest sources um, and they're not vetted like, you know, Audubon, National Audubon doesn't go and vet the nurseries. I mean, there is some process to um, adding them as a resource, but um, definitely put your zip code in, you'll get a list. You'll, if you play around with it, you'll see different ways you can sort it for what you're looking for and it'll give you some resources or your local Audubon chapter even will be listed there so that you can get in touch with them and they can help you find the plants. Great, I think you also answered another one of our questions. Um, someone was asking if there were any nurseries or garden centers on Long Island that carry native so they can find that information at that site as well. Yep, yep, you can go to Great. that um, website. And then um, not only do we have native plant sales, we try to start them early, like um, eight, you know, the beginning of April and then the species change, so we may, and then fall planting, believe it or not, is one of the best times to plant, um, especially shrubs and, and things, because the plants are able to root in, if you're planting in October, the plants are in the ground, it's still warm, the, the soil and the ground, so they're able to root in and then the winter hits and they go dormant. But instead of planting a garden in the spring, say in May or June, those warm days in March and April, those plants that you put in in the fall are able to get a jump on the growing season. So it, fall is a great time to plant. So we've been having a couple of plant sales in fall. You can also look at other organizations that have native plant sales. Um, Rewild is a great one. They're doing amazing work. Um, they're based out of Port Washington. I think their website is rewild.org. Um, if not, I can get you that information to share, um, Caitlin. But uh, Rewild and um, the chapters, Hobos, um, Huntington, Oyster Bay, Audubon Society has a great native plant sale. Um, 
There's Long Island Native Plants Initiative, um, Rusty Schmidt, they grow a lot of their own native plants. Um, so though, and Rusty is one of those people that has a lot more knowledge than me. So their plants are really, really native to Long Island, <laughs> right to Long Island. <laughs> you can probably eat Suffolk County. <laughs> But um, they're a great resource too, and they grow their own. They have uh, greenhouses and um, they have their plant sales, and that's really their mission is Long Island native plants. Um, so any of those organizations are a good place to source them. Um, somebody would like to know what outreach to other organizations in the Huntington and Oyster Bay North Shore area do you have with your programs? Um, in, the particular, in particular, the Plants for Birds program. So what was the first part of that question again? Um, it seems like they're asking um, if you like partner with any other organizations in the area on these programs. Yeah, we do. So all of the other local Audubon chapters we partner with, um, we have volunteers that work with us. We partnered with Limpy to hold one of those um, workshops for landscape professionals. Um, We've partnered with different landscape architects to be presenters on our um, lecture series. We partner um, a lot of the chapter members or um, the chapter presidents and um, board members will volunteer and participate either in our workshops and lectures or in our plant sales, um, helping us with those. Um, We've been in contact with Rewild and we share um, a lot of resources with them, uh, advertising for each other's programs. Um, so yeah, definitely. Um, this is sort of a related question. Um, are there any North Shore landscapers or garden centers that specialize in native plants and native bird landscape installations? So like if somebody wanted to work with a professional to assist them? This is the biggest challenge that we're having in the industry right now. So I feel like we've moved the needle a lot as far as being able to get native plants. Um, that's why we're trying to reach this landscape audience because trying to get um, the actual landscapers that will put these gardens in, design these gardens, um, is really challenging. Uh, Nelson Pope, where Rusty Schmidt um, works, is one that's that's great. Um, I think they're on Route 110, Nelson Pope. And then um, Four Harbor Audubon Society, uh, Joy Serigliano is the president of that, and she's doing some consulting and, and design work, but I know she's really busy. Um, yeah, I can, I can try and work on some more resources. Rewild has some people I believe that they're working with to help people um, put in native gardens. Um, but it's hard because it's a, a very traditional industry and you know they've been doing things a certain way for a very long time and you know, change is scary, but it's happening really quick. I mean, you know, the growers are like selling out of native plants faster than we can get them and sell them and you're seeing them pop up in all kinds of different nurseries that never carried any natives before so it's a supply and demand so if we're asking for them the, the nurseries are going to hold them and the growers are going to grow them so you know we got to keep being really vocal with um you know getting these getting the message out there that this is what people are looking for and if you look behind me here you can make a beautiful manicured landscape using native plants. So a lot of people have a, a preconceived notion that native plants means unruly wild flower fields that look kind of weedy and unkept. But um, that was, you know, one of the driving designs behind the gardens that we have is that you plant big swaths of a species um, it's really well thought out. There's ground covers, there's levels, there's different blooming times throughout all the different seasons. Um, so you can have like a really organized and well-kept um, landscape, but using all natives. Um, someone let, would like to know, how do you prepare the ground when you presently have lawn in an area? 
So um, one of the best ways to do it is um, to use cardboard and depending on the size of the area, of course, but if you want to transfer an area from lawn to a native garden, say like what's behind me, um, they recommend putting down cardboard um, over the whole lawn area. And you could start with a small section and, and see how it goes at, at almost like a test plot um, and then move to different areas and bigger areas. And we're not saying if you have any lawn, you're, you know, you're a horrible person. <laughs> That's not the messaging. Um, you can still have a lawn. People like lawns. I have kids. My kids love to play soccer on the lawn. And, you know, you want to have an open space to sit out or um, have space to move around. But taking, you know, there's a, one initiative from somebody out in um, Southampton whose name is escaping me right now but two thirds for the birds. That's you know one way of thinking of it. So taking two thirds of your property and you know putting in native gardens that are beneficial to the ecosystem and then keeping one third lawn or walkways or patios. Um, so that's one way of thinking about it. And that, you know, even that would really move the needle when all of those different um, areas add up. And the, when a bird's flying over, they're seeing all those different areas it makes a big impact, so. But using cardboard, you can lay out cardboard. Um, I don't have the exact timetable. Uh, Rewild, I think, has some literature on exactly how to do it. But you would lay it out to kill the lawn. Once it's covered for a certain amount of time, the grass underneath is gonna die. Um, just like if you leave something on your grass and you move it after a week, all the, all the grass underneath is dead. So you would lay out your cardboard. And then when you go in, you cover it with mulch, about, I think, two to three inches of mulch, um, an organic mulch. And then you're gonna go in and cut holes in your cardboard to plant your plants right through it so that you don't have weeds coming up, you don't have the grass coming back up and your plants have room, um, your native plants have room to establish and grow. And that's one way to do it. I'm sure there's other ways to do it too, but. Um, so our last question this evening is, um, are bird feeders good or bad for the envir environment and birds, like hanging bird feeders in your yard? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So Audubon, we recommend that you um, only put feeders out, say, the end of October, November um, through the winter. And as soon as the plants start growing and budding, um, when you see stuff coming out of the ground, take your feeders down and put them away because once it's warm enough for the plants to grow, the birds have enough food source. Um, I know some people like to leave them up because they, it, it's a recreational um, activity to watch the birds come to your feeder. And that's okay if you want to leave up a, you know, a thistle feeder and watch the goldfinches or you want to put peanuts out in a feeder and watch the blue jays. Um, you know, you're not doing anything wrong, but it's not necessary from, you know, October, November, throughout the winter, it's helpful for birds because they're, if, you know, the year round birds that are here overwintering um, or the, the ones that are the last ones out or the first ones back, um, it could be a helpful food source for them. But overall in the spring, summer and early fall months, there's plenty of food for them to have. Another thing you have to be careful with is sometimes um, if you have your feeders out during warmer seasons, I'm sure people have had issues with, um, you can get attract critters because of the stuff falling off. So right. you wanna keep them clean and you wanna make sure that um, try and Wild Birds Unlimited and Syosset is a great resource for that. They have everything and they're so knowledgeable, they can help you, but uh, like the, the no mess um, seed blend is the best one because it doesn't leave a lot for critters to go after. Great. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. This has been so informative. Um, I'm sure everyone has really enjoyed the talk. Um, I will send out an email to everyone with the link to this video when it's available as well as some of the resources that were mentioned today. Um, thank you for participating and coming to view this lecture. And as a reminder, Art in Bloom will be on view at the museum June 12th and June 13th. We encourage you to come visit and see the 12 stunning floral arrangements that will be on display inspired by our exhibition, the Heckscher Museum Celebrates 100. And please visit heckscher.org for more information on how to schedule that visit. Come and see the floral arrangements. Um, and if you wanna attend our final lecture in this series, 
the Gardens of Downton Abbey. That is on June 8th, and you can sign up on our website as well. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful evening. Great. Bye, everybody. Take care. Thank you.